Hello and welcome to this week's episode of The Failure Effect. Today we are back with renowned scriptwriter, actor, filmmaker, comedian, Mugambi Diga. Welcome. Thank you. All right. And um, this is part two of our interview that we started, uh, you know, in our previous episode. Now, today we come to you on a little bit of a somber note. Um, we have just learned of the death of Charles Oda. And I believe, Mugambi, being that you have worked with him. Yes. You knew him. I did. Right, so you might have a couple of things to say about that because the next part of this interview impacts, you know, a lot on mm. where he was at the point in his life when he passed on. So um, we're going to take you back to where you were the last time we had this conversation. Right. Right? Yeah, yeah. Which is, you were... I'm trying to remember. <laughs> I, I apologize. <laughs> I believe um no, I believe you... I was at uh, I'd just come back from the country. Exactly. I'd You're come just... back into the country. Yes. And I was just trying to build everything up again. Yes. Ah, yes. Mm-hmm. Um Yeah, so uh I came back in 2009. Mm-hmm. I had all of these very big dreams. Um anyone that's been in the diaspora for a while and has come back to Kenya uh will probably understand what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, we come back with very big dreams with what we have learned uh, from where we've come from. I'd only been gone for two years. Mm -hmm. I had a master's degree in advertising now, pretty reputable university. I had a year of acting experience on the theater scene in Philly, um, been on a film. And I was coming back with the intention of balancing these two dreams, uh, the dream of acting and the dream of um, starting my own ad agency or getting back into an ad agency at a higher level. Right. Um, And by the time we were getting to April of 2010, when I'd been around for six months, I was in a relationship. Mm -hmm. How that happened was, um, there's a particular friend of mine, um, I I won't say her name, but we're still very, very, very good friends now. Okay. Um, and, and the entire time I was in the U S I was really romanticizing when I was missing home, you mm-hmm. really romanticize home. Mm-hmm. You romanticize the sun, quiet afternoons, uh, hanging out with your friends, the social scene, all of that. Uh, when I was out of the country, blankets and wine began. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have to say, I was very excited to come back home and I came back home at the right time, despite right. the things I'm going to describe, uh, because there was an explosion of creativity Mm -hmm. that came out. It used to happen like every five years. Mm -hmm. And 2006 was the beginning of something special. By the time we're getting into 2007, Just a Band was releasing their first album, uh, Scratch Reveal. Mm -hmm. Uh, Blankets and Wine had begun as an event. Um, Wanuri Kahio had released a film called Pumzi. Yes. And by I think 2009 also saw the release of Sugar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the very one. first like mini series. Yes, yes, yes. The yeah. three episode mini series with Lupita Nyong'o in it. Yes, yeah, yes, yes. It had all of these big actors. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Lupita. It had Valerie. Mm-hmm. Um, it had Nick Mutuma. It had uh, I can't remember the poet's name. Really popular poet, um, Antonio Sol. Yeah. All of these people. And yo, it went in when mm-hmm. it came to matters to do with HIV, not mm-hmm. just in how explicit it was dealing with them. Yeah. Um, because HIV communication until then had not been cool. True. It True. was like, it's going to kill you. And um, I mean, if you remember what they were saying about HIV and AIDS in the 80s when it came out, it was like, you are going to die. Yes. Uh, yes. But now it was dealing with young people who yeah. are living with it in a very cool campus, working in a radio station. Mm-hmm. Oh man, it was such a cool series. So all of this was really just like my call back home. Mm-hmm. So I came and landed and I'm like, now where do we begin? Mm-hmm. That where do we begin feeling is 
Yeah. It's a scary one. It's not comfortable. No, it's not. It's okay. not at all. Okay. Then, um, yeah, the girl that I started dating, I pursued her when I got back because I'd been romanticizing a relationship with her. Mm-hmm. Um, and by June of 2010, after I'd been back, we had been dating for a few months. And I realized a couple of things. One, this idea of the life that I'd wanted when I came back was not happening. Mm -hmm. I was back in full-time employment, Mm -hmm. meaning that I was once again going to get cut off from acting opportunities. Right. Um, I hadn't really gone about starting the agency that I wanted or at least making different moves Mm -hmm. as I had wanted to make. I ended up back where I was when I left, back in full-time employment. Except I was working as an account planner on a big account, Nestle, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. for Scan Group Africa. Mm-hmm. And as we had said in the last episode, when I left, it was the beginning of the end. Yeah. Uh, by the time I'd come back, Barat had now really taken the steps in fulfilling his dream. Mm-hmm. Um, and Makan Erickson, which now became Makan Kenya, I think had been taken over by Scan at about three or four years before then. Mm-hmm. And the reason he wanted that account, why he wanted Macan so badly was because of the international affiliations that it had. That it had. Because yeah. Macan had been in existence like forever. It I had. remember I remember um hearing of it first in the early nineteen eighties because oh, yeah. my father ran a magazine really? and he'd get a lot of yes, he'd get a lot of advertising placed in the magazine Which through magazine? McCann Erickson. It was called Woman's Mirror. So it was the pre oh. the, the sort of like before parents magazine. It's what parents magazine was modeled. before then. Yes. Wow. <laughs> yeah, so McCann Erickson. Yes. I mean the the the, the affiliations what kept it going strong, even back then, was the international affiliation. So if yeah. Macan Worldwide had a big account like Barclays, yes. then Macan in Kenya automatically yes. um, had that Inherited account. Inherited that account, yes. yes. Mm-hmm. And Barat wanted in on that action. Yeah. So I discovered when I was employed that I was on the Nestle account, mm-hmm. which was huge. Yeah. It was Africa-wide. We were dealing with Nestle for Africa, and I mean... Um, 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 sub-Saharan Africa, mm-hmm. but Francophone, Anglophone, Lusophone, um, 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 Africa. Mm-hmm. Huge, huge, huge accounts. We're dealing with um, pretty much every brand in the Nestle stable. Yeah. And I realized quickly I was book smart when it came to account planning. And account planning is strategy. Mm-hmm. Account planning is the steps that happen where you're strategizing and positioning a brand and you're positioning the the target audience and right. you're positioning where the brand fits within the target audience and then find out what the best communication touch points would be okay. and what the best messaging would be mm-hmm. for the best audience. Mm-hmm. Um, I was book smart when it came to it. I enjoyed doing qualitative research when I was in grad school. Mm-hmm. It's something I was actually quite strong at, mm-hmm. but I was not street smart at all. I was not oh. street smart when it came to the day-to-day yeah. of account planning, mm-hmm. the extent to which you'd be dealing mm-hmm. with clients. Mm-hmm. I was a creative before. You yeah. hardly ever had to deal with clients before. Yeah. Um, the number of PowerPoints you had to make, uh, the amount of paperwork that you had to look through that wasn't very exciting at all. Yeah. And then, of course, you're not a creative anymore. So you're dealing with creatives and creatives can mm-hmm. be... You start realizing, wait, oh my oh, goodness, creatives can be something else. <laughs> but then you're also in between with uh, with client service mm-hmm. and a creative director. And the fact that I'd come with an education meant that I was intimidating a few people, despite yeah. the fact that I was trying to give a sign that you really don't. I mean, I'm learning this along. Mm-hmm. So it just ended up being one of the most toxic, if not the most toxic work environment I worked in. Oh my gosh. Um, at the same time, um, my, my relationship with this uh, beautiful girl ended. Mm-hmm. She ended it. Okay. Um, Why? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it begs um, the question. It, of course it begs the question. <laughs> she felt, um, yeah, she felt that I wasn't altogether there. Okay. And, and present and okay. I realized that this whole relationship thing I was very new to it as well mm-hmm. um, so the pressure of 
the expectations versus the reality. Mm-hmm. Um, the fact that there was a lot of things that I had hoped for that didn't work out. Yeah. Um, and the fact that for all intents and purposes, everything that I'd kind of crafted was falling uh, down around me. Okay. Now, at the, about the same time, um, Kenya's first global viral sensation, uh, Makumendia Merudi Hahe, yes. had come out. Mm-hmm. Uh, we shot it in April. It mm-hmm. was one of the last things I did before I went and started my job. In fact, the job was already on the way yeah. at that point. I was just waiting for day one. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I went to work, of course, there was this kind of, oh, you're the guy from Makumende. Yeah. And we had imagined, well, I'll speak for myself, but I'm not the only one. <laughs> uh, but I had imagined mm-hmm. that this was going to lead to something. There mm-hmm. was so much hype around that thing. Mm-hmm. There was not a single place where K1 went to that he was not known. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, so just to put it in context, because yes. remember this happened like uh, maybe a decade and a half ago. Yes. And there are some oh people who don't know what Mark Mende refers to. Oh my to. God, you're right. It's <laughs> actually almost exactly a decade. Yes. <laughs> oh, we're old, wow, you guys. Wow, we're wow. old. So what oh, is a Mark Mende? <laughs> <laughs> um... Ah, man. So, Mark Mende, of course, was old school, old school slang yes. for someone who was feeling tough. Mark Mende, you know, uh-huh. it was our version of Rambo, Commando, whatever. Yes. And um, uh, Just a Band. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you don't know Just a Band, please go into your music or your Spotify or your YouTube and look them up. Mm-hmm. Um, we're making, they, they were really, they were going into their second album called 82. Mm-hmm. Um and this was one of the songs that they were releasing. And I think they figured it was going to be one of the bigger songs. Yeah. Whereas um, they took on a very experimental, very pop, but experimental pop sound. Mm-hmm. This one seemed to be the most out there yet settled in what yeah, people yeah. liked. A little bit radio friendly for yes. their genre. Yes. It was. Yeah. It was. And um, and it was uh, produced by Mosioka. And uh, Jim, um, Bithi, Blinky, and Dan. Mm-hmm. Um, these Dan, are the members of who, Just a Band. These are members of Just a Band. Yeah. Um, decided that they were going to do like a black exploitation inspired video. And black exploitation yes. films, films from the 70s that were very often shot on a very small budget, they were made to be seen. Yeah. And they were made quickly yeah. on low budgets yeah. um, and had pretty much, you know, the same storyline mm-hmm. um, or the same tropes. Let me say the same tropes. There was always someone, whether it was a man or a woman, whether it was Richard Roundtree playing uh, Shaft mm-hmm. or or Superfly. Um, or Pam Greer. Or Pam Greer playing yes. Foxy Brown. Yeah. Um, it was all about, you know, kicking ass and taking names. Yeah. And it was almost always in the in the hood. Yeah. It was It was shot in... New York City, all the big cities, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, and in the boroughs of New York, Harlem and them, Mm -hmm. where there was a huge black population. Mm -hmm. And there was almost always kung fu and gunfights and drugs (laughs) and lots of nudity. Yeah, that's that's black exploitation. That is, and for all of you guys who are looking for modern day reference, please go and find they cloned Tyrone. Oh yeah, <laughs> on Netflix yeah. because that's the best that, that's, example of current that's a really day good one. Black exploit. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah, they, they cloned Tyrone. Now, the cloned Tyrone, I believe, came out last year. Yes, in two thousand and nine, mm-hmm. a trailer came out for a film called Black Dynamite. Yes. Yes. I mean- I so remember Black Dynamite? Yes. yes, it's a really good movie. <laughs> and is. again, it's just celebrating. Yes. Um, uh, Dolomite is another one. Dolomite yes. is another one. On, yes. Oh, and that one is perfect. Yeah. That one really speaks about yeah. the genre so well. Yeah. Um, so, so Black Dynamite, the trailer had come out, mm-hmm. and these guys were so enamored by it. Mm-hmm. They were like, what if we were to do a similar thing in Kenya? You mm-hmm. have a badass. Mm-hmm who's coming back into town yeah. and he's angry with everyone because, you know, we don't have the backstory, but he's back mm-hmm. and he's pissed. That's actually, that was the line. Mark mm-hmm. Mende is back and he's pissed. That mm-hmm. was, that kept being the thing. So mm-hmm. uh, they cast K1 because of his... Um, Afro. His Afro-ish <laughs> thing going on. And um, and they shot it and... Phenomenal. 
Okay. Yeah. It is a phenomenon. It was a worldwide phenomenon. It, it, it I was. remember seeing it in international magazines and thinking, what? Yeah. Kenyans can actually get here. It was the very first viral phenomenon. Yes, it was. Right? So now you're here, right? You've got your your ad agency dreams shelved. And then you've got this, your relationship is floundering at this yes. point in time. And then you've got this viral phenomenon happening in your life. What was your state of mind at that yes. time? Now that's that's the question right there. Yeah. Um, and you've kind of alluded to it. Mm-hmm. Um, it was 2009, it was 2010. Yeah. And people didn't quite know how to deal with success on that level. Yeah. What do you do? Yeah. The word was always monetize, 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 monetize. You need to make money out of this. You need to make money. You can't be um, trademark the property. Mm-hmm. Um, um, the, the, the first thing that happened, the video came out was there was a thing called Mark Mende facts. Okay. Uh, much like the Chuck, Chuck Norris facts. Mm. Um, Chuck Norris doesn't do push ups, he pu- pushes the earth down. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, Got it. Um, Chuck Norris doesn't cheat death. Death apologizes to Ch- Chuck Norris for cheating <laughs> him. Um, things like that. So there were a lot of such, yeah. you know, facts about Mark Mende. A mm-hmm. website was formed. People tried to form a Twitter handle and a Facebook page. But fortunately, Justin Bann had gotten ahead of them mm-hmm. and done that. Mm-hmm. And then someone formed MarkMende.com where they just listed the facts. So... Just abandoned to respond with MacMede.org. Yeah. And now we realize that all of us had been part of a very, very big piece of IP. But you don't know what to do with it. Yeah. yeah. Um I I credit Just a Band to this day for choosing at that time to remain creatively independent mm-hmm. and not give in to what every push and pull yeah. was. But we the cast. Mm-hmm. were not quite spared from the thoughts of everyone as to what should happen, and least of all, not K1. True, because yeah. he was... He was so, a face. Um, for those of you who don't know, K1 uh-huh. is the the man who played the titular character, yes. Mark Mende. Um, his name is Kevin Miner, yes. but everyone calls him K1. K1, yes. yes. <laughs> so, so we were in this place where we don't know where it goes, and you don't know what the next steps for fame will be. Yeah. Um... A radio station, I won't say which one. Okay. Uh, jumped on the hype. Mm-hmm. Um, and they decided that they would use Mark Mende to launch, relaunch their morning show that was going to have two new presenters. Okay. <sighs> now, in uh, sometime when Kiss was still new and Kiss FM. Yeah. And they were, uh, I, I don't know if you remember, Kiss FM had this tendency of really taking on ambitious creative projects. Yes. Whether it was very clever radio commercials that were very yeah. titillating. Yeah. Like the Clan Day Club. Yeah, yeah. There was literally a commercial club. Yes. About the Clan Day Club, which was supposed to be a, a club exclusively for people who are on an affair <laughs> to go and, <laughs> and, and be there, not be afraid. Yeah. And, and the tagline was, because we care about your affair. And like... <laughs> Kiss was always doing these really big things. Okay. So when they were trying to relaunch uh, Pilsner Ice mm-hmm. and they were launching a character called the Iceman, uh, they staged this thing where Caroline Mutoko was uh, kidnapped. Yes, I remember that. I remember that. And then it caused that? this uproar. It did. Because people thought it was real. Because and they didn't it was realize real. it was the very first episode of Cloud Chasing this country had ever <laughs> seen. <laughs> Absolutely. So it was Cloud Chasing for Carol and it was Cloud Chasing for this Iceman who was the person who was going to yes. rescue her mm-hmm. from these unnamed kidnappers. Mm-hmm. This other radio station decided to take the same approach. Right. Okay. And Mark Mende was the person who was going to rescue these two morning presenters. Oh, so they, yeah, yeah. So they 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 they, they staged a few things. One of them mm-hmm. was no presenters on the morning of the launch. Yeah, or the morning of the first day, and uh, it's because they were missing. Yeah, and um, they started a campaign, like a hashtag, of. Uh, I'll, I'll just say the presenter's name. Hashtag Gaetano is missing. All right. I remember that one too. <laughs> yes. Now you remember. <laughs> um, he was supposed to have an interview on um, on 
JK Live. Yes. On on the bench but when they were still at at Fairview, I think. Yes, yes. And and uh, he wasn't present. And he wasn't present. And so <laughs> Jeff Konanga is like, uh, we don't have our guest today. And today we are benchless. And we're like, no, the bench is still there. It's the guest you don't have. <laughs> Okay. Anyway, all of that hype as it was growing, yeah. I remember we were getting more and more afraid. Yeah. Because we were seeing Twitter people saying, let this be a joke like they did with Carol some years back. Like, yeah. oh, we're going to be so mad. Yeah. So, um, uh, just a band now under, I mean, Mark Mende, uh, the profile on Facebook was like, whoever kidnapped mm. Gaetano and Eve, I'm going to come and smash your face in yeah and when people started catching on what was going on they started they reeled or like mcmendy who had been a hero now just became, this before yes. now people went off in the comment section being like i don't give a you know come and kick my you know what come for me whatever it's me and people are now really trolling so we what? go from from viral sensation to trolls just showing up yeah and we had to continue the contracted work with said yeah, um, radio, radio station. station where they created a story and um, the two presenters uh, showed up, tied up. And mm-hmm. I was one of the actors who I was, a, I was, my character was called Taste of Danger. And I'm yeah. the one that had kidnapped them. Yeah. And uh, Mark Mende came and, you know, rescued them and yeah. um, fought with my henchmen, of course. Yeah. Of course, you know, chopped all of them and then um, showed up and set them free and yeah. now they could be back on radio. Yeah. Yo, 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 yo. It didn't do that well. Oh, I'm sorry. And um, the plans to make it now like a... The, the, the plan at that point was to make it like a series of, yeah. of YouTube videos featuring all the characters that you saw in the video. Yeah. Many of whom were just hinted at. Yeah. To make stories around them. Yes. Um, and then to put these stories up and film them and, you know. Yeah. But very quickly, um, uh, the Just a Band people realized it was a lot of work. Yeah. For very little return. And already this whole thing had not worked out as well as expected. Mm-hmm. So very soon... The Mark Mende hype, as we know, as you knew it, kind of died off, mm-hmm. and all of us were left like we we did get a paycheck yeah. from that job, yeah, and it was a pretty okay paycheck for the time, but you know now that was done, yeah, and so my job is not working. Oh, but my relationship ended not too long afterwards. This chance at fame mm-hmm. fell through, and I'm in the most toxic work environment, and I still don't feel fully settled or at home, yeah, uh, from from my. My stay in the US. Yeah. So all of that combined into what I learned later was clinical depression. Okay. Now I did not know what I was going through. Yeah. I, I could not, there was no name for it, mm-hmm. but I was finding it difficult to wake up in the morning. I was yeah. finding it difficult to um, to get myself up and get in the shower and dress up. I was always I was also dressing up in formal clothing to go for my advertising job and I'm like I hate this I hate this I hate this. Yeah. Um I would sit I was living in Guma at that time. I was sitting in the car and um and uh, and just weeping in the car before going to work. Oh. And it's not because it's not just a sadness. People um and I'm I'm glad that I'm speaking to an audience now that is really aware of mental health and mental illness. Mm-hmm. It's not just sadness. It's a feeling of despair, a feeling yeah. of despondency, a feeling of emptiness and numbness to the world. And yeah. you don't, you look in the mirror and don't know who this person is looking back at you. Yeah. You wonder where that joy, that vitality yeah. that you had for life has gone. Yeah. And you mourn it. And that's, it was that, I, I'm going into my office to mm-hmm. meet with these toxic people and fight fights again and, and have my boss who was an okay dude, but under... A agency of, pressure yeah. was oh he could go and become something else yeah and it was gone yeah. I felt like a part of me had gone 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 and died and would never come back mm-hmm. I lived in this state for about a year and a half mm-hmm. it was bad it was terrible ah I didn't want to wish it on anyone but the worst part of it all and 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 the reason why I think people really need to have the conversations about not just mental health because mental health is such a catchy buzzword now yes no conversations about mental illness yes 
Exactly. Yes. yes. Not, not, not mental health because mental health. health is your state of being okay. You're all right. Yes. But there actually is mental illness, illness. which is the, not, the things that yeah. are, are, are causing um, a problem to mental health. The things that are, and it's not being caught in jam or or the state of the economy or what. It's mm-hmm. what's going on in your brain. Yes. Um, as a result of all of these pressures. Mm-hmm. That's the stuff that we need to be talking about. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I still had a social life. I was earning okay money. Um, mm-hmm. And I'd go to a blankets and wine. And I'd, I remember being in the States and being, I really want to attend these blankets and wine. Blankets yeah. and wine was growing. Um, there's still a lot of creative projects going on, but I was, I was just not there. Yeah. Now, I have to talk about one particular night. Uh, when um, uh, Just a Band continued on their upward tra- trajectory, their growth continued, and mm-hmm. they had an album. Hahe was just one song in an album with various songs. Yeah. And they had various ways of uh, releasing videos, shooting videos and releasing videos for various songs. And they're all on YouTube, beautiful songs. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, there's a beautiful video for Half and Puff, a uh, beautiful song for Ordinary. Ah, every, ah, ah yeah. Shake it like you mean it. That's all. Shake it so delicious. <laughs> you know, listen, my brother is one of them. And, yeah. you know, it's a lot of music that they have in their catalog. So yes, even they I do. can't. <laughs> oh, what's that song called? Something people, everyday people. Uh, anyway, I'm for, uh, everyday people is the other guys. Yes, it's it's everyday people. Is it everyday people? Yes. No, everyday people is uh, um, everyday people. No. They're just a band song. is called something else. Forever okay. people. I think it's called forever people. Okay. okay. Yes. Well, t- um, <laughs> They had all these videos coming yeah. out and to celebrate these videos, I, I was not involved in many of them now because yeah. I was, um, I, I had a full-time job now. Mm-hmm. The the hey, is the last one yeah. I had shot with them. And um, to celebrate it, there was a European media company that wanted to cover them. Uh, yes. They were shooting for a video exhibition called Kudishnyao. Yes. Kudishnyao, of course, is the yes. Tanakalia Sauti for yes. a gun going off. Kudishnyao, mm-hmm. which we used to use as kids. Kudishnyao. Mm-hmm. And it was a video exhibition for which they were going to use very many of the songs that they'd released in 82. Mm-hmm. I ended up shooting one with them uh, called Can I Be Forgiven? Mm-hmm. Can I Be Forgiven was an experiment. They had intended it for one of their newer songs. So around this time, uh, just a band in, in addition to 82 was also releasing a lot of um, other like experimental music. Uh, they had a song called Away. Mm-hmm. Um, they were preparing for this video exhibition and they had organized a shoot that was supposed to be the official music video for Away mm-hmm. where they had this really cool concept that people step into a taxi and you know, they're sat at the back of the taxi for some reason. They are just bearing their most private yeah. thoughts. The ones that you never let anyone see because they're so ugly. Yes. One person um, confesses to hitting his wife mm-hmm. hard. Oh. Someone else con- um, confesses to uh, to stealing, to using their water company to just amass lots of money, even if what is a free resource. Someone else says, next election, I'm going to have a gun in my house. I'm not going to be caught Whoa. like I was last time. Yeah. Um, a lady is referring to how her husband has become such a weakling and that's why he, she cheats. Someone talks about hating white people. Someone talks about hating Somali people. It was just a bunch of videos. Yeah. If taken out of context, they could be really dangerous. But mm-hmm. as part of the context of these are just people in a taxi and they're confessing. And I think there was 12 such videos. Mm-hmm. Um each cast member had just been given a line. Yeah. Uh, they filmed it really smart with rare projection, and um, which is basically they went out and shot the Nairobi streets and then they put this uh, on a computer and then projected the image of the back of, of, of the outside of Nairobi in blurry camera and then had people sit in the car with a screen on which the project- projector image was falling. Mm-hmm. Rare project projection. When the, you put the camera in front of the subject and they have the projection of the city behind them, they look like they're in a car moving. Yes. Even if they were in a mm. stationary car the whole time. Yes. 
Um, then they had guys with uh, torches, um, colored torches ref- representing street lights, mm-hmm. and they'd move mm-hmm. the street lights back and forth in front of their faces. Yeah, that's how they shot. Um, Can I be forgiven? That's what the program was called. Wow. So at the end of that day, there was a European. I can't remember from what media house they were that wanted to do a feature mm-hmm. on Just a Band. And so when we left the shooting venue, we went back to Just a House. They're all living together yes, at this yes, point. Yes, they were. <laughs> uh, somewhere in Lovington. And um, I remember that evening feeling, oh, it's coming. It always felt like a cloud coming mm-hmm. over you. And where you were able to fake being happy during the day, by the time the evening was coming and your energy levels are going down, you know, if you haven't eaten, the cloud comes. And I could feel that cloud coming. This is what the beginning of a depressive episode feels like. Yes, okay. it does. It does. Right. You can feel it's, it's like dark clouds forming. Yeah. Dark clouds forming, dark clouds forming, yeah. dark clouds forming. It's here, it's your sight, it's your heart, yeah. it's your body. And I could feel it coming. And I remember the rest of that night really just trying to fake happiness. Okay. Pictures were taken. We all looked really happy. Uh, what basically happened that night was an impromptu concert uh, was put on. The, the, the media company was going to be filming just a band, mm-hmm. putting on a concert for their friends in a house. And it was going to form part of the documentary feature mm-hmm. that they were going to go and cut and present to their viewers in Europe somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, so they put on a concert, you know, Jim sang, Blinky sang, the yeah. guys were there on their things. Uh, Mayonde sang. It was beautiful. It was wonderful. We wore party hats. There was finger food, like, you know, popcorn and crisps and stuff. And yeah. the cameras were on us at some time. And there was a feeling of euphoria at the end that kind of lifted my spirits. But mm-hmm. I was so sad. And I remember thinking to myself, is there anyone in this room who feels the way that I do? Is there anyone who will understand if I tell them that I'm so disconnected from all the joy I've known in my life? Yeah. And this is all just a show. Mm-hmm. Very many years later, when I was looking at the pictures, I realized that in that place, in that space with me was a dear friend of mine mm-hmm. called Wahora. Right. Wahora Kanyoro. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, wow. Yes. yes. Wahora had lived with depression since she was, I believe, 12, 13, 14, since primary school. Yes. yes. And you, okay, um, again, for context, um, uh, doctor, doctor, Wahora Kanyoro, she was a doctor who was very interested in the arts and the creative scene. And spent a lot of time hanging out with her peers, mm-hmm. right, in the creative industry. Did she ever act or sing or she was just like very She never closely. let on. Okay. Yeah. All right. But she, she was never always, let on. Yeah. But um, she was always like very joyful and warm and positive. And, and positive and yes, bubbly. And exactly. she was um, um, a singer. She, she, she sang, she acted, she danced. Mm-hmm. Um I directed on a bunch of uh, plays that we did for Mavuno, which were happening at around the same time that I was Mm -hmm. flailing. And um, she was in the room that day. Mm -hmm. Um, She was part of the people there. I had no idea what she was going through. She had no idea what I was going through. Yeah. And we were friends. Yeah. Mental health issues were still... Mental health was not really a buzzword at that point. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm, again, this is 2010. And uh, and you didn't really, you wouldn't share what was going on if you were depressed. Yeah. You know, because what, what does that mean? You know, there was, it hadn't really come into the public conversation. The only reason I knew I was depressed was because I did a, a poll mm-hmm. on our website. I, I typed in, am I depressed? Mm-hmm. These are the signs to check for if you're depressed. This, right. this, this, this. If you ticked more than six out of the ten, I think I ticked seven or eight, mm-hmm. uh, then you're definitely clinically depressed. Right. But now that you have that information, what do you do? What do you do with yeah. it? Where I do you go? Know. Yeah, where do you go? Yeah. Do I go and see a, and we used to call them a shrink? Yeah. Anyway, and a sh- shrink is literally short for head shrinker. Yeah. Which is what they used to call 
Psychiatrists. Psychiatrists. Yeah. But then, do I go and see a head shrinker? Mm-hmm. Um, am I going to start need to start taking meds? Is this the end of my life as I know it? All mm-hmm. of these questions mm-hmm. just going in your head. And then you don't want to let on in front of your friends yeah. why you're sad. Why are you sad? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I just feel that way. I had no idea that Wahora was going through the same thing. Okay. At the exact same time. Yeah. We are on those pictures smiling and looking happy, but... This thing that was affecting people, there was so, not just me and her, mm-hmm. but hundreds of mm-hmm. other young people, people of our demographic, yeah. who are going through the exact same thing. Yet, I felt so, so, so alone. Um, yeah. It affected my work, of course. You, you, but the, the other thing with depression is you become overly desensitized to things, but then also hypersensitive to other things. Yeah. When you start to feel like you're in danger, and that's another thing about depression, you feel like you're in danger and you don't know where the danger is lacking. Mm-hmm. Um, you become hypersensitive to the things your workmates say. Mm-hmm. And not just the things they say about you, but the things they say about the world. Yeah. Because they seem to be surviving so well in it. Mm-hmm. So you start to really hang on to things that might be very misleading or very toxic. Mm-hmm. You don't ever feel like you're at home in your own skin, much less in a friend group. Mm -hmm. And if you don't feel at home, even in your own home, now what hope is there? Mm -hmm. You don't feel at home in the office. You don't feel at home in your home. You don't feel at home in the shower. You don't feel at home in in bed. You don't feel at home on your desk at work, your desk at home. You don't feel at home in front of your couch in the TV. Food doesn't taste good. Drink doesn't do anything. Can't except sleep. what it does. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're either sleeping too little or too much. Yes. You have to work 10 times as hard to groom yourself. Yeah. Going to the barber means being around people. Yeah. And Mugambi, Mambo VP, and you're like, I can't. I can't do this. Yeah. Um, I, I'd wear hats all the time because my hair would just grow okay. out. Um, and, and then you feel like a letdown yeah. to yourself. I, I, I never told my parents. I only told my parents that I was going through a depressive episode. Years after it was way behind us. Oh, you know, I was depressed back then. No, you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then... Yes, past tense. Yeah, and, and I suppose when people, especially from a certain age group and at a certain point in time, when you say, imagine I was depressed, what they hear is, Aki, I was feeling very sad. Bus. They don't hear, I actually could not function. Bus. You know? Yeah. 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 That's that's that that was the feeling. Yeah. And I and I felt like admitting it to my parents, admitting it to my siblings, admitting it to my friends was admitting weakness because you should have been stronger. Yeah. You shouldn't have let the sadness win. You ought to be happy. Yeah. Um I really became curious about depression at that point. Mm-hmm. And not from the point of view of what it is, but why it's such a difficult thing to talk about. Yeah. And I had myself as a test subject. I I knew I knew to talk about not being able to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That I think started my trajectory mm-hmm. in being very passionate about stories to do with mental health and mental illness. Okay. A passion that continues to today. Mm-hmm. Simply because back then, for the year and a half, um and and um with a relationship long ended I kind of fell in love with this other person who created such a beautiful space for me to exist mm-hmm. and and be like, oh, depression? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've been there before. Mm-hmm. And she described her her symptoms and I'm like, oh my God, I've never felt so seen. I'm in love. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, it didn't last very long either. Okay, okay. Um, but, but but this was for different reasons. This was for different reasons. And, and with her, we're good friends as well. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I, I was in a terrible place, mm-hmm. Admi- ad- admitting admitting that weak- weakness to people and not being able to communicate about it. The silence around mental illness is just as harmful yeah. to the person going through the illness mm-hmm. as the illness itself. Mm-hmm. I believe that just the silence, the stigma around it will do a lot of harm to them. A yeah. lot of people didn't know that Wahura was mm-hmm. depressed mm-hmm. until... Until, Until what happened, happened when happened. she passed yeah. on, yes. Um, I, I really was not seeing an end to it. Then then a couple of things happened. Mm-hmm. Magical things. Okay. Oh, man. Yeah. Um, uh, one of them was uh, I left Makan. Okay. 
I, I am grateful to this day to my boss for moving me upstairs from Macan to Scanad. I was taken off the Nestle account completely. Mm-hmm. And um, I was put on some other more fun accounts. Mm-hmm. And in addition to the strategy behind the creative, I could also work on the creative. So I started shifting towards creative slowly by slowly. And the creative was pretty decent. Mm-hmm. And then in between that, um, a film was shooting. Now, I went and auditioned for this film, didn't get the role. And then the person who got the role dropped out. And that's how I ended up getting a role on Nairobi Half-Life. Oh, wow. Yes. Which is, I think, my... No, not I think. It is literally my favorite Kenyan movie and continues, continues to, be. to be. I cannot think <laughs> of anything else. And there've been a lot of decent productions that have come up since. Have. But Nairobi Half Life. Nairobi Half Life is big. It's some, still something special. Yes. Um, a lot of hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people hold the same view okay. as you. They love that film so much, so much, so much, so much. It's it's mm-hmm. it's rare. It's becoming more common now. Yeah. You know, with Gen Z and. You know, there's a bit of distance from time with the film mm-hmm. uh, for for me to meet people who have not seen it. Mm-hmm. But nine out of ten people will have seen the film. Yeah. And each of them can speak about how for them it was like, uh, oh, my God. Yes. Uh, it premiered in 2012, but we shot in 2010. Okay. Um, when I had, I got the role, I went into an office, an, uh, an empty office that like, was still waiting to be occupied and danced. Oh, wow. It's the first time I moved. Even my body was like, what's going on? We yeah. haven't moved. We <laughs> haven't felt like this in a long time. Yeah. I was so overjoyed. Mm-hmm. My first day of filming was going to be the day, I think, after I had. And I was going to be picked up from work mm-hmm. and, and taken on to set. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of my scenes happen at night. So it made sense that I was be shooting after hours. Right. And I remember being in the van. And being overcome by a very familiar feeling. The, feel, the feeling of being out of place, but a very different type of out of place. Mm-hmm. Again, depression depression puts a, like a thick wall, like a thick void around you. And you feel so separated from people. You can be sat next to someone and feel miles away. Yeah. I felt that way in the van. However, the reason I was feeling this way was because these guys had been shooting for about a week and a half, probably two weeks. And they were buzzing. Mm -hmm. There was so much good energy on that set. Mm -hmm. People were so excited about this thing that they were creating. Mm -hmm. And of course, I was shooting the role of a dude who may or may not be gay. Yes. um, And who happens to experience a liking for Mm -hmm. the protagonist, the main main character, Moas. And so um, I was cast late. Mm-hmm. Uh, someone else had been cast. They knew someone else was going to be playing that role. So I get into the van and people are like, sorry, what role are you playing? Yeah. And I say, I'm playing the role of Cedric. And they're like, but, but, but did the... you know that the role of Cedric was changed? They weren't informed. Yeah. So already I'm feeling so out of place. Right. And then I'm already feeling like these people are talking about the day before, the day before. And I remember on the way to set thinking, if these guys are shooting on film, I'm done. Because if they're shooting on film, and I start forgetting lines. And I start, the, conver- the, the performance is not good. Ooh, you can't I was so scared. Yeah. I was like, we're wasting reels of film. Yes. So one of the first questions I asked was, so this film, is it being shot on film? And they say, uh, no, we haven't seen any of those stacks or mm-hmm. re- reels or rims. No, this is being shot on digital. And I'm mm-hmm. like, oh, okay, cool. Then I was next to the props person and they said, do you want to see films? Uh, do you want to see photos of behind the scenes and I was like yeah please show me Mm -hmm. and as I was looking at these pictures and they were like yesterday we were filming in a toilet it felt real (laughs) now you remember the scene I'm talking about yeah okay listen I watched it the other day (laughs) I I was eating mokimo please do not remind me (laughs) so the toilet scene yes yes yes. they were they had shot that the day before two days before so yeah. they were buzzing mm-hmm. and I, I i remember feeling to myself maybe i can allow myself yeah. something of that joy that these people are feeling mm-hmm. and maybe it'll work out i was very afraid my goodness i was afraid 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 mm-hmm. we were going to black diamond 
Right. Uh, we were going to shoot the scene where I come into the club with Moaz for the first time oh, yeah, and we yeah. have a conversation. Well, you, you've invited him out for a drink yes, in Westie. Yes, I've invited him out for yes. a drink in Westie. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> hey, yes, exactly. <laughs> Are you a guy of pints? You go catch one in yeah. Westie. Yeah. Uh, we'd film that Are you a guy of pints line, which people still quote to me today. Mm-hmm. It's so amazing. <laughs> um, and, and, and that we filmed many days later. But my first scene to film was where we were walking into the club. Oh, wow. Then the next scene was where we sit down and we have drinks and we have a conversation. And then you start dancing. And then the next scene was dancing. And then we finish with a montage scene where we are sat outside and time is passing and I'm smoking a cigarette as Moas is telling us a story. Okay, wait. So so you shoot these three pivotal scenes before you have your first, you know, um, appearance meetup yeah, yeah. where you're sitting on the steps of the Kenyan oh, National Theatre. Oh, that was Theater. days later. Okay, so the <laughs> chemistry that we see in the club yes. had to be generated on the spot, literally. Fortunately, because oh, wow. we had uh, auditioned together. Yeah. And then I, I met him on... Actually, this is a bit of trivia. Um, you'll notice that on that day, my, my, my clothes are a little bit oversized. Okay. I might look like I'm baggy and, you know, dressed in baggy clothing. Yeah. But it's because even the wardrobe department was not... Yeah. informed. Yeah. There was no time to inform every single, the dozens and dozens of people in every department that the yeah. actor has been changed. So I was wearing the previous actor's okay. wardrobe. Okay. Um, and then I meet um, I meet, I meet uh, Joseph Babu Erimo. Mm-hmm. You know, every time I'm walking on set as you, the, the ADs are supposed to assist you and tell you where you're supposed to go, but a lot of the ADs don't even know. So for a bit of time I'm walking around Black D, it, sun is still up. We're going to start filming when the sun went down. Oh, wow. Um, wondering where to go. So every department, I'm, okay, f- so first you need to go to wardrobe. I go to wardrobe. Eh, 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 uh-huh. Gina Mogambi, Roliako, Cedric. Then you see the guy with Cedric's, when do you Cedric? Hi, <laughs> then you see them checking <laughs> their notes. Is, so every yeah. single person, when do you Cedric? And every reaction was either, when do you Cedric, Ama? Oh, and your Cedric, <laughs> because they know the scene that's yes coming that's up. Coming. Oh, the one where you guys later, were locked up in, we were in, in a this box. G- yes, I felt so out of place. My goodness, but Babu, God bless him, has such a nice energy, so accommodating, so welcoming. Yeah. So we started talking. We started talking, and we in between takes and in between things, we're just talking. This was the first time I think I was formally meeting Tosh, Mm -hmm. he would not remember that I'd worked with him on a TV series Mm -hmm. way before where he was a first AD, but now he's the director. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the first time formally meeting Tom, um, who was the executive producer, supervising director. It's the first time I was meeting a lot of these people and Mm -hmm. I was nervous. Mm -hmm. Nervous, man. But as we started, soon we're finding our stride. Yeah. And one scene down, another scene down, another scene down. No, one shot down, another shot down, another shot down. And then that is a full scene. That's That scene is done. And then we go into the next one. Yeah. Something beautiful was happening in my heart. I was okay. like, I'm shooting a movie. I'm living the dream. I'm that little boy. Yes. The one who went to what, you know, was, was constantly watching TV yes, all of the time the and absorbing, you know, yes. Um, the behind the scenes yes. information and then watching all of these musicals yes. and then now here you are. And now here I am. Yes. And I remember being that little boy again watching showbiz today yeah. and all the lights and all the the boom mics yeah. and the director and they with their headphones watching a monitor. Mm-hmm. That was me except I was in front of the camera. Yeah. It was... It was beautiful. Yeah. It was beautiful. That, 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 that day come, came to an end. I went to sleep and I must have gotten some of the best sleep I'd gotten in a long time. Okay. Okay. And I filmed every 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 scene. Um, the scene in the theater. There, there's a deleted scene where we're driving in the car, where we're driving to the club. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was a very... Uh, we, we filmed that um, on another separate day. Yeah. Um, there was the scenes in the theater, mm-hmm. uh, the scene in the box, which was filmed in a backyard of the production house. Oh, wow. It wasn't inside. It wasn't a... There, wasn't there was two a, boxes. There yes. was the box that we jump into. And then, and then the, there's the, the box that you shoot in that because shoot quite in. obviously you can't fit, yes. you know, cameras and two human yes. beings in that. Yes. So we had the open front. <laughs> yeah. All of these um, ended up 
uh, culminating with me begging to be on set for the days that I did not need to be on set. Why? Because I wanted to take it all in. So. It was a dream. And I just wanted to be there to just... I, I, I still was very... I was still such a novice. I was still an actor. Yeah. This was my only my second screen role. Mm -hmm. And the first one was for a TV series. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see what it's like on a film set okay. where everyone knows what they're doing. Okay. It was hypnotic. Okay. Hip, hypnotizing. Like you... It was magic. And I just wanted to be there among in the magic. But you gonna okay, so so just to understand, because remember you've left your job at Makan, right? Yes. I'm at Scanad now. Okay. Ah yeah. right. So you're still getting paid. Yes, I'm I'm still okay. working full time, okay. which is why I was doing night shoots. Okay. And then for the two or two days, two days while we were shooting at Phoenix, uh -huh. I asked for days off on okay. that day. Yeah. Okay. All right. So it's just two days of shoot. Um, and then the night shoots. Okay. Yeah. And Nairobi Half Life was also paying. Yes, but not much. Okay, all right. Yeah, so not it much. Was mostly it was mostly a passion an, role. Yeah, it was okay. an educational project for everyone. So all of it was on on it as a passion project. Okay. Um, but that that was one of the turns. Yeah. The second uh, turning point, of course, was no. The third turning point, aside from being moved out of the toxic work environment, and I mean, even Scan had felt different. There was more air. There was more yeah. light. Yeah. <laughs> we were higher up. Makan was. Um, was it on the first floor? Was it in? It felt like a basement. It felt oh, like we're chancery. in a basement of the chancery. Yeah, I think it was the first floor. <laughs> it felt like a basement, man. It felt like you got into the lift and went down. <laughs> but I think it was on the first oh, floor. Lie. Okay. But um, here there was more light. Yeah. There was more joy. Yeah. It, it felt nice. Yeah. And and people were friendly. Yeah. And the work was fun and. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to dress in my formal clothes anymore. I sort okay. of transitioned my 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 wardrobe back to the more casual clothing. Mm -hmm. And then I'm shooting a film. Mm -hmm. And then um, you know, the the the, the disappointment of Mark Mende was fully behind me by mm -hmm. this point. And then I was in this relationship which seemed to be okay, but mm -hmm. The girl I was dating seemed to have an issue with the fact and she realized, oh man, okay, it's one thing to be depressed yourself. It's one thing to know what it's like for as depression for someone else. Mm. Something totally different to be dating a depressed person. Yes, yes, And indeed. she kind of set herself free from that, mm -hmm. which I did not see coming. Oh. It jarred me so violently. Like, like when she said, I want to break up, I was like, what? How long had you guys been dating? About, well, part of it was long distance when she was out of the country. Yeah. I'd, I'd say about 13, 14 months. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Enough to make a significant Oh, yeah, yeah. There definitely yeah. was. Oh, there, there definitely was a connection. So yeah. when she wanted out, uh, by this point, I had been at Scanad for a few months and had moved over to Ogilvy, Africa to start working on the Airtel account. Mm -hmm. And I was doing pretty well there. Now I was a fully fledged creative. Mm -hmm. And life was starting to look up, even if I was still dealing with it. And mm -hmm. she was like, this depression, and remember, we've shot Nairobi Half-Life by this point, but yeah. depression is something that even the depressed person almost has to wake up and feel differently to feel. Yeah. I guess I'm out of the worst of it now. Yeah. Um, but, but that breakup was so jarring. It was like, like I don't know. I feel it's, it, it was almost like something the brain just clicked back into place. Yeah. And I started feeling like myself again. Okay. I was 32 by this point. I had been living with depression for about, for cl close to two years. Okay. By this point. Mm -hmm. Now, this would look like it was a failure. Yeah. And it was to a large extent mm -hmm. because that huge disconnect with myself felt like some lost years. Mm -hmm. But... It wasn't entirely that. Mm -hmm. There's still some things that happened in the midst of it. And I know people who are living with the worst cases of depressive episodes or periods of anxiety who are still living. It's yeah. just that the thing, the world is not designed for people with mental illnesses. This is true. It's designed for people who are productive. Yeah. And I'm sad to say just productive. You have to be productive is the first thing. Yeah. Your your good family life, your good recreational life, your good spiritual life, your good all of these still come to the nucleus of are you productive first? 
to allow you the freedoms to be all of these other to things. To be all of your... And I think that's also the reason why people don't understand how, for example, death by suicide would happen at the tail end of, you know, a depressive episode. I keep saying... If you have malaria, if you have pneumonia, if you have, you know, the flu, if you do not get it treated, it will kill you. Yes. In the same way, whatever mental illness you're suffering yes. will kill you if you do not get it treated or at least be aware of its existence. Yes. So, you know, I wish there was something that people understood and then would give people suffering, you know, mental illness, a little bit of grace. I, I wish it's it, the, the last thing that you said. Yeah. It, it ends up being that this person is in the afterlife. They're not here anymore, but yeah. you'll still victim blame them. Mm -hmm. And you'll still put it on them. Yeah. Why didn't they say something? But they looked, but they acted, yeah. but they... And using, using your same... Um, using that same... Um, metaphor that you used just now where, mm -hmm. you know, you have malaria, you have pneumonia, you have whatever. Mm -hmm. um, mental illness feels like you had an arm yesterday. Right. And you lost it and it grew back and you wake up and it's missing again. And it's a severed limb and it's bleeding all over the place and you uh, don't know what to do. Yeah. And you don't know what to do. You might bleed out right there. Yeah. Except the severed part of you is your, is up here. It's your. Right. It's 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 a part of the very vast network of neurons, mm -hmm. um, in your head, and you don't know which one is going to fail to fire that day. It's mm -hmm. it's 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 hell, man. Yeah. I cannot describe, and I I don't even think I experienced the worst of it. Let me not make it like you know. I I at one point um, the worst of it was me taking a retreat and taking a few days off at a Catholic retreat center in yeah. Karen. Um, and asking for days off from my boss. By this point, I had lost weight. Um, my skin was shades darker. Mm -hmm. I walked with a stoop. I, mm -hmm. My eyes were half masked all the time. Um, and I was always keeping from bursting into tears. Right. And and even the bursting into tears was a good thing because I had not really gone into the bit where I was so numb that even the feelings and emotions were not there anymore. Mm -hmm. that, that bit of you... And and I had a therapist tell me this. Have you been crying? And I say yes. This was recently mm -hmm. due to something else. And they said that's that's good. Mm -hmm. If you're still in touch with that part of yourself that is weeping, and then that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. And and I was still very much in part of that bit of me that was asking myself why. So right. the worst of it was crying for, I think, two days straight. So okay. much that I <laughs> was chugging water. Okay. Chugging water because I was losing so much of it. All right, to rehydrate. Yes, to rehydrate. <laughs> literally, okay. literally, literally sitting and just crying for hours. Yeah. For hours, for hours. And by the time I was driving home, I was like, what happened back there? I don't know. But and yeah, to me, Leah. <laughs> so I, I want to redirect the conversation a little bit because yeah. um, first of all, for those of you who want to catch up with Nairobi Half-Life, <laughs> you can find it on Netflix. But I want to talk about um, your very first effort directing. Okay. Which is Lusala. Yes. Which you can also find on Netflix. Yes. Um, <laughs> and this is the thing about Lusala is that it is about a topic that is very, very close to your heart which is mental illness, right? So, like, how do... That 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 bridge between where you were after Nairobi Half-Life and how you got to Lusala, what did that journey look like? I went from being an actor on Nairobi Half-Life yes. to being a co-writer on another film called Kati Kati, yes. which I co-wrote with Mbithi and was directed by him, also mm -hmm. available on Netflix. Mm -hmm. And then went uh, I went on to be head writer on a film called uh, Supermodo. Yes. Um, which was directed by Likarin Wenaina, mm -hmm. uh, based on an original story idea from him. Mm -hmm. um, in between... Um, and Supermodo is, is really quite big. This is an award-winning movie. Oh, Supermodo is the most awarded <laughs> film in Kenya. Yes. I, I'm not joking. Like, yes. Google it. I can say it confidently because yeah. we lost count mm -hmm. as to the number of awards it won. Yes. And when we lost count... Personally, when I lost count, it was like at 40-something. Wow. Uh, when Likarion lost count, it had reached the 70s. Uh-huh. Individual awards mm -hmm. given to this film this from around excellent. the world. It's it's crazy. Yeah. Um, I had also um, 
I joined up with two friends and we started writing uh, musicals mm-hmm. uh, called the Village Series, Village yes. Easter, Village uh, Christmas. These were comedic musical plays where we'd take a story from the Bible and apply a Kenyan context, mm-hmm. twist it around this way and that mm-hmm. and make it fun. Mm-hmm. Or make it very cerebral. By yeah. the time we wound up that, we were really talented writers. And um, I ended up being one of the co-writers of a series on Zuku called Groove Theory, mm-hmm. which is about um, students uh, in a fictional university trying to start a band. Right. Um, season one, the four titular characters were played by K1, Kevin Maina, who I got to work with again, Elsa Fanjora, uh, Pascal Tokodi, and Kevin Samuel. Mm-hmm. Kevin Samuel couldn't return for season two. So he was replaced by Charles Souda. Okay. So Kevin Samuel is Janet Bogo's twin twin brother. Yes. Uh, not the okay, well, twin. Okay, but brother. Yeah, but brother. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I think younger brother. Okay. Yes. Okay. And um, it was such an honor to work with him. I loved, I loved working yeah. with him, but he couldn't make it for season two. I think yeah. he left the country. So Charles came and took his uh, place. Uh And uh, the people that were in this series had to be able to sing, dance, and act because Mm -hmm. it was a musical TV series. Mm -hmm. We were really experimenting with good stuff there. Yeah. I mean, of course, you can see the rough edges on it now, just like you could then, but we were really... I mean, every every episode had three songs. Mm -hmm. Um, One was a cover, two were original songs, at least three songs. And Mm -hmm. we... We loved, we were singing, we were writing songs, we were writing prose, we were writing dialogue. It was beautiful. Excellent. We received training for it. It was, it was great. Yeah. Actually, um, yeah, Fesi Mosoke, Tina and Duba, mm-hmm. um, Tina and Duba Banja were mm-hmm. the three writers on it and it really got us started on our writing careers. Mm-hmm. And that's to some degree how I ended up on Kati Kati okay. and then Supermodo. Okay. So Lusala, mm-hmm comes around on just like Supermodo, we started writing as literally as Katikati was enjoying its phenomenal success. Yeah. We were starting pre-production on Lusala just as Supermodo was enjoying an even more phenomenal right. success. Uh-huh. Now a little bit of backstory behind that. Yes, it's a story about mental health and mental mm-hmm. illness. We didn't quite know that going in. Aha. Uh-huh. What was it supposed to be? It was supposed to be a story about family and the tensions of a family okay. where um, a member of the family who wasn't an original member of the family starts presenting a little bit of... Uh, odd behavior? No, it, it, was, it wasn't even odd behavior. It was just a tension okay. of... Um, the question around it was, imagine where you are that you have a small daughter let's imagine she's four years old Mm -hmm. and you bring in a seven-year-old cousin Mm -hmm. and they grow up together Mm -hmm. and your daughter is now becoming a woman Mm. and you look at your cousin the cousin and he has been a man for a long time Mm. and you start to wonder what if the two of them yeah like what yes and and you know we wouldn't even put it that way we'd be like what potential dangers might be there yeah yeah particularly because this guy is not of our flesh and blood. Yes. And he, we know that he comes from really difficult Mm -hmm. background. Mm -hmm. Um, Yes, we took him in and kept him here for 11 years, Mm -hmm. but now it's time for him to go. Mm -hmm. That was still the gem Mm -hmm. of the idea from the very beginning. How it unraveled played out a bit differently. Yeah. I was not the writer on this. The writing team had already been together for a bit, but Mm -hmm. through no fault of their own, the story was not coming together as organically as 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 Katikati had to me and Bithi and mm-hmm. as uh, uh, Supermodo had to me, Likarion, uh, Silas Miami, Wanjirika Kuru and, um, and Kamo Wandongo, mm-hmm. who were the four writers and the director with the original story idea on Supermodo. Mm-hmm. It was just very, very difficult to land yeah. the plane. And yeah. that happens. Yeah. I have to say to and anyone who's involved in media or, or the arts knows that there's that piece of work that does not always land the way you want it to. Mm-hmm. And there's a few 
choices to make when that happens. One, go with it, which is what we decided to do with Lusala. We just decided to continue moving. Or two, postpone the whole thing. There was mm-hmm. no time okay. to postpone Lusala. Lusala was, we knew, was going to be the last film of the One Fine Day series because okay. they were going to transition into other things. Okay. So there were not, a lot of money had been spent, a lot of schedules had been freed up, particularly from the crew who mm-hmm. have attendance of being very busy and the mentors mm-hmm. who were coming in from right. different countries. Most most of them most of them were coming from Germany mm-hmm. who were very busy. Um, the cinematography mentor, for instance, was the same person that was a cinematographer on Nairobi Half-Life. Okay. And he wasn't on the same level as he'd been when we were doing Nairobi Half-Life. Yeah. He had grown. Yeah. Grown. He was very very much in demand. Yeah. So we could not possibly, mm-hmm. as, as much as the story hadn't quite landed and had been sealed and this is what we wanted to do. You couldn't postpone. We could not postpone. Yeah. So the implication of that was a few things. One of them was that um, we were literally writing the film as we continued wow. shooting. Um, on some days... Um, I was the one leaving set last. Why? Because I had to sit and start writing the series for the the the, the scenes for two days after. Okay. A scene for the day after, I would have to. Let me let me summarize the story. Okay. The the story wasn't coming together as well as it should have. Mm-hmm. So in an emergency meeting, we. Um, Chatted, um, and and this is a bunch. I'm, I'm, when I say we, I'm referring to a bunch of people coming yeah. in and out of the process. Uh, some contributing, some not. It was very complicated. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we had to break down the story from beginning to end mm-hmm. by scenes. Mm-hmm. And by the time we started filming, some scenes that were in the what was supposed to be the shooting script were removed. Others were added. Yeah, and that meant that we had to be writing mm-hmm. as we were shooting. Mm-hmm. Um, Bithy was uh, brought back as a sort of like supervisory role um, um, so that he could assist with the writing because um, um, we we now we now were going from day to day. It mm-hmm. was now day to day. The actors were brought into um, um, an acting and improv workshop mm-hmm. uh, with a really phenomenal um acting coach from Germany called Bridget. Mm-hmm. Um now you know the the cast of of, mm-hmm. of, uh, of Lusala, of course Brian Ogola. Yeah. Uh Sibur, that's what I call him now. Mm-hmm. Uh, who played um uh, who played Onesmas, the uncle yeah. figure, mm-hmm. Mkamze Motella, who played the aunt figure, mm-hmm. uh, Alice Wangari, who played Joma, mm-hmm. um and um, and then a bunch of other supporting characters. Um mm-hmm. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm 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 blanking out on some of the characters. I, I can't match the name with that. Sorry, name, but, I'm yeah. sure they know you have them in your heart. So yes, I, I really do. <laughs> and um, a bit of backstory: I haven't had much sleep because I had phenomenal stomach upset last night. So I still have a, a bit a bit of brain fog. I keep all this. Um, it's, it's yeah. cool. I, I'm, I'm much, if I haven't run off, okay, <laughs> then I'm better now. You you know you're better from a stomach upset. Yes, if you do if you not... if you chance gas and it's just gas. <laughs> Okay, we did need to know this, but okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. That was that was the, before I left the house. I was like, let's chance this. Okay, that that's that's all there is. Okay, that's cool. I can get into the cab to come here, but I was afraid, man. Anyway, so um, all of these actors were really really good. Uh, they had been cast early, and we were casting them as we went along. Yeah, but we were all involved. Uh, Eddie Kimani was there. Nice Kidinji was there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, uh, we, we, we got, we became something of a family in all of the bonding and the improv and the, and the acting exercises that we went in yeah. to do. But now the, 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 the exercises now had to be focused towards story. Mm-hmm. So we cast, mm-hmm. um, the, the workshop was also like a casting workshop. Mm-hmm. And so we cast everyone and then threw them into improv exercises where they would try different scenarios yeah. and we'd watch the videos yeah. and use those as the basis of, okay, this is the chemistry we're seeing between them. What, how can we rewrite this and scene? And then, yes. It was a lot of work. Please remember I'm the director of the film as well. This is the thing, because this is your first effort. This is my first feature film. Right? And you, it sounds to me like you don't even have that much experience in front of the camera to begin with. (laughs) (laughs) 
and I don't know how much experience you have script writing, you know? I mean, you've done your movies with just a band, yeah? But those are short music videos. Um, but it's not the same. Like, Lusala happened that... in 2018. Yes. So by this point, I had done uh, Supermodel, we'd done Kati yes. Kati. Ah, so the writing okay. experience was there. Right. Um, I'd had the experience of doing a lot of directing for theater. Mm-hmm. I had also been part of, because you said so, our improv comedy group. And Jason Runa would be a wonderful person to have on this show because yeah. BYSS was born out of failure. Yes. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. It was born out of a very important part of his life, failing Mm -hmm. and hitting the ground. That's where Because You Said So came out from. And so there was improv chops and I I knew how improv works Mm -hmm. and I knew how to kind of um, get what I need to get out of watching people improvise. Mm -hmm. But I had until that point only uh, directed um, an, an experimental documentary but, and I was coming off of five months of uh, of film school. Very mm-hmm. quick touch and go, touch on this, touch on this, touch on that, touch on that. Because there was so much to do in a very prestigious um, German film academy. Right. I literally came and joined the Lusala team. Like probably four, four days after I landed. Mm-hmm. Um, that's when the writing was happening and... It didn't, it, we, we had the story that we wanted to tell, but it wasn't quite there. So mm-hmm. that's why we had to now do all of this work mm-hmm. behind the scenes. Keep, so yeah. I, I am directing, but mm-hmm. I'm also, the scenes that I had to handle on, on set and, and rewrite as we're filming. And then, of course, having to answer dozens of questions every single day. Uh-huh. Now, this is uh, the failure project. I... I'll be very honest and say that it's taken a while for me to see Lusala as a success. Which I will tell you this. I mean, watching it, it is such a genius work of art. It's it's <laughs> Thank you. very, very beautifully put together. I mean, you can see a little bit of, you know, there's this bridge on uh, Ngong Road, yeah, that doesn't actually it's not actually a bridge it's just it starts on one side of the road and then it ends and then you can see where it was supposed to connect on the other side of the road but there's nothing in between to make it a bridge so you can literally just do like it's it's like jumping off of um what you call that board into a pool yeah 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 yeah, yeah, that's what it feels like Uh, and you can see sorry excuse me maybe a couple of those in lusala but for the most part it is such a believable, very, very well put together story. I'm just sad that it only lasted an hour. Uh, and there's a reason for that. Yeah. There's a reason for that. Uh-huh. By virtue of the fact that you were writing this film as we were going along, mm-hmm. we we're doing the final rewrite as we were shooting. The final rewrite on paper and then the rewrite, that the inevitable rewrite that you have to do on set. Mm-hmm. Um It's said that a film is written three times. It's Mm -hmm. written on paper, then it's written on the shoot because you'll never ever find the perfect locations. You'll never, an actor will bring something different, a location will bring something different. Uh, Shooting times will go this way or that. Budget might be found or lost. Um, And then the last one is in the edit and Mm -hmm. in post. That's Mm -hmm. the last rewrite. So we're doing two rewrites at the same time. We're, we're We're doing the final rewrite of the script as it exists. And then we're doing the rewriting on the screen. Mm -hmm. That is very difficult to do. Yeah. I could not help feeling on set like, oh man, we had complete, Bithi had a complete script to work with Mm -hmm. on Katikati. Likarion had a complete script to work with on Supermodo. Mm -hmm. Now this um, project that had been untitled for a long time until we decided to call the boy, to call the, the film Lusala. Um, and credits to Silas who said this is a terrible idea mm-hmm. when I said we should call the film <laughs> <That's>, uh-huh. Kikulacho. <laughs> but why? Because uh, we had seen uh, one of the previous iterations of Lusala was that he comes into the family and acts mm-hmm. something like a parasite. Okay. Very much like the film Parasite. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, but that, that, that ended up not happening. Kikulacho kingoni mako is the thing that's eating you. Is It's inside your clothes. Yeah. It's inside your home. Yes. Um, but that ended up not being the thing. Mm-hmm. We also, I had also seen that as Kikulacho is in your head. Mm-hmm. Like the thing that's eating you yeah. is in your head. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so it's, I don't think it was a bad name, but Lusala is much better. Um, so um, the fact that we were writing the film as we were shooting it meant that in edit, immediately when they started working on the first rough cut, there were already scenes that weren't working for the full story. Mm-hmm. We never ever really had the chance to have the story from beginning to end and see it from 10,000 miles away mm-hmm. so that we can now come and see how we can deal with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. On, on a smaller level, yeah. I had to be like this and like this and like this and like this every single day. Mm-hmm. Why you were that film cleaned me out. My oh. energy reserves were so... By the time we were going into shooting, I was already, you know, stretched. But yeah. now shooting itself. Yeah. Oh, you know, whatever, wherever you place the camera, whatever thing you tell the actors to do, that's it. You can't... Yeah. You can't change it. Yeah. You can't change it on the day of shooting. That's it. That's just how it is. Mm-hmm. Remember, I'm writing as we're shooting. Yeah. And remember, we're still figuring out the totality, the big picture view of the story. Yeah. And then I'm also having to deal with a lot of um, imposter syndrome. Mm-hmm. And my friend, imposter syndrome is showing up in real life. Yes. Oh, you shouldn't be doing this. You don't have a full script. Oh, you shouldn't be doing this, you know. You haven't written the scenes for tomorrow. How, do, how on earth mm-hmm. do you go about writing a film? as you're shooting it, mm-hmm. doing the final rewrite of a film as you're shooting it. Ah, mm-hmm. oh, man, it was hard. Um, second last day of shooting, I had a crew member who... I'll, I'll say this now. I, I think we can still be friends if she hears this, but she should not have been on that film. And she should not, should not have been given... She could have been on the film. She, sh- she, sh- she should not have been in the position that she was. Okay. Because she was close, very close to me. Mm-hmm. And turns out was a little bit manipulative, okay. was was causing little clicks and clubs within the thing. And mm. and I, I heard that she was on another set and doing the same thing. And she was not very polite, not very kind, and not respectful of how a film should work. Was so, she part of the cast or the crew? Crew. Okay. So she went off on me one day mm-hmm. um, when we were filming and she decided that she was going to list all her issues with me. Mm-hmm. Issues on a set inevitable yeah issues on a set where you're all figuring things out even yeah. more inevitable issues where the director feels like he's in over his head and doesn't know mm-hmm. you know there's i didn't have answers to every single question because mm-hmm. i i didn't think about this last night yeah i didn't think about this yesterday there was no yeah. time um there was a lot of tension mm-hmm. and she went in this is the second last day of filming Mm-hmm. Why would you be having this conversation now? Yeah. I have a problem that you did this and this and this and this and this in front of people. Very disrespectful. I did not like it. And um, that entire day I already felt like, um, you know how you feel when your blood sugar is low? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. And you start to feel a little bit lightheaded and you feel like all your emotions are now all over the place. Mm-hmm. I've been feeling like that. Mm-hmm. So as she's talking to me, I'm eating my potatoes. Because I'm like, get that blood sugar up. <laughs> yes. But when she finished, she walked off. We were going back to f- film the rest of the scenes that we had for the day. And um, as I was saying, this needs to happen. I remember I froze like that. Uh, what I'm trying to say is um, 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 and the CD skipped. It just, it, it was the LP. A loop. Yeah. Just started looping. Right. I couldn't put a sentence together. I was feeling lightheaded and we were shooting by a pool. So at one point I felt like I was going to fall in. Mm-hmm. And the crew realized something is wrong here. Right. Something is wrong. So the medic was called. Um, I was given this solution. I was told to sit in the shade and I just sat there. Almost catatonic. Wow. Yeah. I, the fatigue had hit. The bodies had said, mm-hmm. we're done. And this is after, was it triggered by this confrontation? I think the confrontation really brought it out because, okay. you know, I don't like confrontations. Confrontations yeah. take energy. Yeah. And she was demanding answers of me. Yeah. I, it was not nice. She was like, eh, hey, now tell me. Oh. Okay, you've said this, now say this. And it's in front of people. So I'm being like stripped down in front of people. Yeah. And I was really trying to be civil and whatever. And uh, but it wasn't okay. Well, so so did this uh, episode continue into like full blown depression or did it? Ah, that's a good question. So I was taken home early that day, and they continued filming what they could. 
ironically enough, the lady that I'd had a fight with lived mm-hmm. the same route as me. Yeah. Um, and I was just sat in the front, very quiet. Mm-hmm. Uh, very quiet. We weren't saying a thing. And we started a conversation and I'd been listening to a podcast and we just started talking about money or something. And it was a podcast about a book called The Spirit of Money and we talked about it and she was like, oh my God, that's really, really nice. Oh my God, that's so, you're so insightful. You're so, and I'm like, you manipulative. Yeah. Oh, now, now, because it's, you know, it's hit the fan and you might feel like you're responsible. Now you're being all friendly again. Oh, come on, man. That's that's the point at which I knew, man. Pick your crew well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. they can destroy you. Mm-hmm. They can make or they can destroy you. So anyway, we came back and filmed the last day of filming, and um, this interesting piece of trivia: everything we filmed on those last two days ended up on the cutting cutting room floor. We shot about an hour and twenty five minutes, maybe an hour thirty five minutes of Lusala. Wow! But we cut. I think 15 minutes was cut, 20 minutes was cut before the first cut Mm -hmm. and the rough cut. And then we cut off even more because we had to find something that was the story. And that is why the film is the length it is. And you did such a brilliant job, you guys. And then it won a whole bunch of awards as well. We made the film in edit (laughs) and it finally was done. We reached picture lock. Uh, we managed to do whatever other things, the grading, the sound design, the music mm-hmm. design, um, um, the, the special effects that were needed. Mm-hmm. And then finally, we um, we had a film. Okay. Kati Kati found an, mm-hmm. a festival very quickly. Mm-hmm. After it went into post, after, after someone saw it in its picture lock version Mm -hmm. it found post money and found a festival like that right um supermodo had a festival before it was even complete Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like it was already programmed in the festival Mm -hmm. while they were still sitting in post Mm -hmm. with it lusala sat for months but not finding a festival when did it come out though we finished shooting lusala in uh, okay, let's let's just we, we we finished shooting in June of 2018. Mm-hmm. We finished editing mm-hmm. in November of 2018. Mm-hmm. We were finished with a final sound mix in April of 2019. Mm-hmm. Um, and it premiered. It had its local premiere, its Kenyan premiere in June of 2019. Okay, it was the opening film of. Uh, than NBO Film Festival. Right. Katikati and Supermodo are also opening films of the mm-hmm. NBO Film Festival, but mm-hmm. they had their world premiere, their global premiere at TIFF, mm-hmm. Toronto International Film Festival, mm-hmm. and Balinali, the mm-hmm. Berlin Film Festival, respectively. Mm-hmm. Lusala was still flailing. Oh, it did man. not find... We thought it was going to end up in TIFF. One of the TIFF programmers came on set. Yeah. And then she was like, uh, no, no. Now, the fact that it was one hour long was not doing it any favors. Okay. How festivals operate is that people still buy tickets. Mm-hmm. They still buy tickets and they'll sit their butt down and watch the film. That's still how it works. It's mm-hmm. still very much a cinema experience. It's held in cinemas across a country, True. across a city. So TIFF will have Toronto, um, Berlin, many Berlin films, even in Bio, it'll be spread around many screens, mm-hmm. but people are still buying tickets. Programmers want people, programmers of festivals, the people selecting the films, want people to watch the films. Mm -hmm. And they want people to feel like they have value for money when they're watching the films. Right. A one-hour film in a film festival that has one-and-a-half-hour films, two-hour films, is not value for money. Yeah. And so that film will not be on the best footing when it begins. Uh Uh-huh. That's one of the reasons why it was not really finding the festival. Mm-hmm. The other reason was that it was just a difficult film to place. Okay. Whether it was genre-wise, it has it's a drama with certain elements of supernatural things going on. Mm-hmm. You could say supernatural if you look at them from the Kenyan perspective mm-hmm. of, you know, demons. But mm-hmm. then it's also happening in someone's head. So there's thriller elements to it as well. And again, I have to say, 
um thank goodness for the team that i had uh, kevin uh, kevin wangombe who goes by the raw who was the editor of the film uh, christian kramer who was the editing mentor guy wilson who when we had hit a wall in the editing looked at the film and said move this scene here move this scene here move this scene here move that there move that there if we do this timeline the film will make sense mm-hmm. and we tried and it worked mm-hmm. and that's how we found the edit that ended up being the final edit right film is such a collaborative process we do filmmakers as a whole a disservice when you put everything on the director yes the director is the one that makes lo- mo- most of the most um significant uh, uh decisions mm-hmm. but they it takes a village and we really it really took a village to find lusala where it was i have to credit all the actors they were freaking amazing they were so oh amen all of them <laughs> and um and regardless of all that this film was flailing for months there was radio silence between myself and the producers as to what the fate of the film was so between june of 2019 and about october november of 2019 i had nothing no one and for me who's sitting at home and going on with my life no one wants the film it hasn't been programmed nothing until i think november or december of 2019 we had that it had been um accepted at the international film festival rotterdam which is a really good festival how they solved the problem of it's a one hour film was they just programmed a short film before it and lusala and this short film all traveled together during this film festival <coughs> this was in january of 2020 when right. lusala had its global premiere january 2020 and it still went through covid season and won all of these accol- <laughs> i like i like that you talk about the one awards lusala won <laughs> just a couple of awards yes. a handful of them yes uh please remember it was preceded by supermodel that yes by this had, point had the the number of awards was probably in the 50s because it's kept on winning awards yeah. later on i was at the premiere of supermodel in berlin yeah there was a room full of close to a thousand people men women and children eating this film up mm-hmm. eating it up by mm-hmm. the point the climactic events of the film happening are happening people were crying mm-hmm. tears yeah um when katikati premiered at tiff yeah mbithi was on the way to the airport really happy that yeah this film has screened i'm so happy yeah This dude received a call midway to the airport saying you need to come back your film just won an award. They turned the taxi around and he showed up with his luggage still in the car to accept this award which was the Fipreski prize mm-hmm. uh which is a very prestigious prize um in the discovery section the section of the film it was of all the mm-hmm. Fipreski is the International Federation of Film Reviewers or Film Critics and they picked Katikati as the most standout film they saw mm-hmm. in that section. Lusala premiered at TIFF at at um, IFFR. Mm-hmm. Please remember a room full of a thousand people. Yeah. For uh for 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 for, for Supermodo. Um because I was the director of the film, I was very happy to be in Rotterdam. Mm-hmm. I was my first time in 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 the Netherlands. Mm-hmm. Um I was excited. My film is premiering, man. Mm-hmm. It's going to be seen by people. So Let me just make it clear that that will never take that joy away. Okay. I'm still so proud okay. of that film and what it managed to do. Mm-hmm. When I met uh when you get to Rotterdam, you check in at your hotel. For some reason, I think this was universe kind of softening the blow to come. Uh as I was at the lobby of the hotel, um the dude takes my passport and looks through it and says, "Oh, we've upgraded your room. You're not in a single room. Uh, you're now in an executive suite." Oh, wow. For no reason. I was like, I don't know why, <laughs> but they put me up in an executive suite, yeah. which was really two and a half rooms mm-hmm. from one. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, this is nice. You have your big lavish bedroom and then you have your meeting room and you have a coffee station and a big bathroom. It was wonderful. Hey, boss. I was like, this is nice. Yeah. Um I went downstairs to meet my chaperone. The chaperone sort of guides you around and they take you to the cinema so that you can test your screen. Mhm. 
test the screen, test the, make sure everything is fine. Is the sound okay? Is the picture okay? I remember walking with her and being like, I, I'm not going to ask her where she's taking me. You I've just, seen some of the bigger screens. Yeah. I hope I'm being taken to one of those. Mm-hmm. Bro. To Lipeleko Kwa Cinema Kadogo. Where I remember we walked in, I was like, this is a dimly lit cinema, man. It's like, and it had many screens. <laughs> I walk in and the maximum capacity of that theater must have been probably 250 people. Yeah. Maximum. Yeah. Naikuja. So that was the premiere of Lusala. Okay. To a, a room full of people that were there to see the film, yes. They were there, they saw the short film, they saw the film. And I remember at the end of the film, there was a sigh. Mm-hmm. I can't tell, and I'm being honest with you, I can't tell if the sigh was a sigh of satisfaction or a sigh of it's over. <laughs> we were really getting into it, it's over. Don't and I get that from a lot of people. <laughs> that the film is so short, it seems to end so quickly, just when you feel like, well, oh, yeah, that, and then boom. Yes, just and when it's finally picked up pace and then you wonder, oh, okay, so what happens? What the happens demon and then it's that's over. living in his head? Like, yeah. is he okay after that, you know? We do find a way to resolve the film. He finds peace. Uh, he, he battles the demon underwater. He yeah. comes up and he finds his peace. Okay, you'd better make a Lusala 2 or 3, like a scene. <laughs> no, thank you. No, thank you. No, I'm good, thanks. We're all good as far as that one goes. So when the the film completed, uh, yeah. it completed screening. Um, Supermodel had applause all through the closing credits and after. Uh, Lusala had probably about 15 seconds uh-huh. of applause. Mm-hmm. And, oh. and people got up and left. And Bithi came up and they, um, they do a, a brief Q&A and yeah. half the room was present for that. Yeah. And when it was done... Um, Bithi, uh, who gave me the reassurance that watching the rough cut of Lusala will have me wanting to quit the movie because he felt the same way when they saw the rough cut of Katikati, assured me that this is how it is. This is how it okay. is at IFFR. Yeah. People clap and they up and leave. Many years later, someone who was Dutch came when I shared me telling that story said, um, actually, I'm half Somali, I'm half Dutch, and the Somali side of me lives in Kenya. Yeah. So, um, you know. Yeah. I've been to Kenya many times mm-hmm. and I want you to know that's how the Dutch are. Mm-hmm. Nothing personal, that's just how they are. Mm-hmm. They're just yeah. personal and... Yeah. But I remember going back to my hotel, back to my executive suite, <laughs> feeling this film has not turned out anything like the others have. Mm-hmm. And at that point, I really had to start falling in love with the film for myself. Yes. And that's the thing about failure. You can pull yourself out of failure by all visible aspects. You can have a successful film Mm -hmm. that has played at a festival. Um, Lusala was successful at IFFR. Mm -hmm. There was an audience scoring and the top scoring film was the biggest film of that year, Mm -hmm. uh, which was um, Parasite. Yes. Uh, But it was the black and white version because Bong Joon-ho went back into the... Uh, into post and was like, if we make this film black and white, mm-hmm. I think it'll be even more powerful. Mm. And somehow it worked. Yeah. It was. Parasite was excellent. Yeah. Parasite ended up winning Best Picture and Best International Film at yes. the same Oscars. Yeah. Best Director for Bong Joon-ho won, won a bunch of awards. Mm-hmm. Um, its audience score and Lusala's audience score were only hundreds of points apart. Mm-hmm. We were both in the 4,000s. Mm-hmm. So that was like 4,700 and Lucella was like 4,400 and something in audience points. There you go. And the funny thing is, after I left Rotterdam, because of its good score, Lucella ended up playing at the biggest screening space. <laughs> but I was at home. I was in Kenya. Yes. Like this. Oh. So the point I'm making is, by every definition of success, you would still consider yourself A failure. Mm -hmm. So it's all about what is in your head. Ultimately, this is the key message. Which is cute because I was about to ask you if you were to sum up the one lesson you have learned about your journey with, you know, clinical depression and whatever career career failure you think you're experiencing. How would you put it in one sentence? I think that would be it. You know, I I will answer that question. I will say, though, we got into the pandemic Mm -hmm. after Mm-hmm. IFFR. Mm-hmm. 
literally I came back to Kenya yeah. a month and a half all of us were at home wondering what yeah. is going on and what would have been a robust or at least I imagine might have been a robust film run for Lusala yeah never happened okay i never flew to another country because of Lusala mm-hmm. um even if we were expecting i was going to go to brazil and yeah. spain and wherever all of that down yeah. so i never even got to enjoy mm-hmm. a festival run mm-hmm. i fell into depression again I'm pretty much out of the woods now. Yeah. And that's it. That's the story of it. Okay. I I when I whenever I tell someone about Lusala, I've never screened Lusala for myself in any of my screening spaces. Oh wow. Because I'm still fostering my relationship yeah, with that yeah. film. Yeah. I, I and I'll be honest about that. I keep saying it's a film that I'm learning to fall in love with for myself. Mm-hmm. And it's taking time. Mhm. Every director has that with their film. Mm-hmm. Um Bithi had to find a relationship with Kati Kati because he was still watching the film he made. Yeah. Even if other people were watching the film he made. But Do you understand what yes, I mean by yes, that? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. They're watching the film he made, but you're watching the film you made. Yes. And you can see all the kinks, you can see all the things, all the things, all the chinks in yeah. the armor, all of it. Yeah. I still have to get past that. Mm-hmm. And then not having been validated by a good festival run or lots of awards. Mhm still have to validate it for myself. Yeah. Okay. The way I do that for myself is I have to take the big picture look. Mm-hmm. And that is what I would tell to anyone that sees what failure is. Yeah. We are highly subjective creatures. We have very primitive brains. Mm-hmm. Our primitive brains still exist to have us running away from a beast. We still have fight or flight, which is such a primitive We don't have the reasoning of I'm in trouble what mm-hmm. do I do can I reason with this thing and can find out no it's fight or flight yeah we still we still have our most executive functions led by yes tiny little bits of our brain yes that have not evolved that much since our this is ancestors. true since 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 the days that we need that instinct to survive that is who we are mm-hmm. that is still very much who we are yeah our dealing of what is successful or failure is still very this dimensional yeah what i'd invite anyone who's been in the middle of failure not i'm um opening myself up to do right now is always view where you are and be present to it yeah. because it is part of a larger continuum that you will never be able to know as you are now true you will always be subjective to the point you're at because you're there true you're not anywhere else yeah however you can foster within yourself something of a time mhm mhm Mhm. Now, yes. Amen and hallelujah to that. I love I love that approach to failure. Like, you know, you you can you know, hindsight, I suppose, yes. allows you to look at everything and connect the dots backwards. And you'll be like, yeah, that was a useful situation. That wasn't a failure. It was exactly what I needed to get mm. to where I am now. Right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh my goodness. So uh, profound. I apologize. So, I mean, on I believe, that note, um, um I would like to say thank you to you I believe I was at, uh, I just come back from us. the country. I come back into the country <laughs> and I was just trying to build everything up again. Ah, yes. Yeah. Um Yeah so uh, I came back in 2009 yes. I had all of these very big dreams um anyone that's been yes. in the diaspora for a while and has come back to Kenya yes. uh, will probably yes. understand what I'm yes. talking about 
uh, we come back with very big dreams with what we have mm-hmm. learned uh, from where we've come from. I'd only been gone for two years. I had a master's degree in advertising now, mm-hmm. pretty reputable university. I had a year oh of God. acting experience on the theater scene this is in ins- Philly. Yes, um, this is so inspiring. Thank you. You've given and me fresh perspective. Even I was coming back the with the intention the of effects, balancing but these me two dreams. New things uh, the dream of acting I just and want the to dream of... Thank you um, so much for blessing us with your wisdom. Starting my own ad your agency time, or your story, getting back into an ad agency your insights. at a higher I mean, level. Now we're all going to go back um, and watch all of the rules that you've been by in the time on we Netflix were getting and go like, oh, now I, I know what was happening of 2010, when, when that scene was for being shot. Months, <laughs> I was in a relationship. All right, so on that, that note, happened was, um, you can use um, the social media handles a to follow Bugambi on his channel. And we will see you next week for another um, one just like and this and one. the entire time